The Nintendo 64 was 64 bits. Nintendo's marketing heavily emphasized that fact when comparing it against the PlayStation. The N64 had better graphics, apparently, and according to them, that was down to its 64-bit power. But then, the GameCube, Wii, and even Wii U were 32-bit systems, and yet, in my opinion, I think they might be just the tiniest bit more powerful than the Nintendo 64. So, some of you may be thinking that these were mostly a marketing gimmick. Sure, 64 bits might have had some benefit, but clearly they weren't that big of a deal. In fact, the N64 CPU, while being fast enough that it was a non-issue for the programmers, might have actually been a bad idea overall once we evaluate the console as a whole unit. And the 64 bits? They were a pretty big part of that. And some of you may remember now that there were games that were originally released on the Nintendo 64 and then either got straight ports to the GameCube or they were emulated in the Virtual Console for the Wii U Wii U. How did these 64-bit games run on 32-bit hardware? And what even are bits? Well, generally speaking, what we mean when we say bits is weird and kinda complicated, but most of the time it's either in relation to the console's address space, or sometimes how many bits the CPU can modify at once, or maybe something third. Let's take the Zilog Z80, the Master System's CPU. It can address 16 bits at once, it has an 8-bit data bus, and its ALU is 4 bits wide. That means it's an 8-bit CPU. The Super Nintendo's Rico 5A22 has a 24-bit address bus, an 8-bit data bus, and a 16-bit ALU. That is... it's a 16-bit CPU. Why? Anyways, uh, the Nintendo 64 can, if it wants to, and this is the important part, address 64 bits at once internally, and operate at 64 bits at once. However, it didn't, and here's why. First of all, we should look at the advantages of operating on 64 bits at once. We can operate on 64 bits at once. That means we can handle longs and doubles way faster, which are great for things that need high precision. The Nintendo 64 sadly didn't need this level of precision. Secondly, while we have a 32-bit address space that lets us access 4 gigabytes of space, a 64-bit address can let us access a whole 18.4 billion gigabytes, which ought to be enough for anyone, I hope. As some of you may know, floats and integers take up 32 bits of space, bytes take up 8 bits, and so on. So, with a 64-bit CPU, we can operate on one of them at once. If we wanted more, we'd want simmed operations, single instruction, multiple data. The N64's CPU does not have this, therefore, you are not going to process two floats at once or whatever just because you have 64-bit mode turned on. That's not how it works, sadly. So, what were the drawbacks? Well, the Nintendo 64 was famously limited in its RAM speed, so it would really suck if 64-bit mode not only ate more RAM, but also ate up more RAM bandwidth for the same operations. And it would. Using longs and doubles, it doesn't actually matter much in video games, especially when they look like this, and we're just gonna basically waste more memory while using them. Great! And the worst part is, the Nintendo 64's memory space is still 32 bits wide. It was cut down to save on costs, and that of course means that pointers are only 4 bits wide instead of 8. Yay! But that also means that storing doubles and longs in RAM takes up twice the time. And the best and or worst part of that is that the RAM bus is 8 bits wide as far as the CPU is concerned, so in fact we're wasting 8 more cycles and not one more cycle when trying to save a 64-bit value, therefore basically no video games ever use longs or doubles. The real issue with the Nintendo 64's CPU was that it focused on something that didn't matter. You see, the more transistors and complexity you add onto a chip, the more it costs. 
That's why a 50-90 is $2,000, while a 50-50 is $250. The N64 CPU had 32 registers, which were either 32 bits wide in 32-bit mode, or 64 bits wide in 64-bit mode. If the Nintendo 64 CPU had no 64-bit mode, not only would you be able to cut down on the complexity of the internal bus and some of the processing parts, but you would actually be able to save the money on registers, or have twice the registers, both of which would have obviously been really nice. The N64 was hilariously overspec for this console, and this 64-bit mode probably made the cost go even higher. I wouldn't be surprised if a MIP CPU that was both 32 bits and like a third the speed would have meant Nintendo could have saved more money on memory that wasn't garbage. Actually, that's kind of like the PS1 CPU. And indeed, the story on the PS1 was a little bit different, so let's look at it to get some perspective. The architecture was far simpler. No perspective correct textures, no floating point units, or on the GPU, not even decimals. This unfiltered raw look when mixed with the beautiful dithering pattern created a very recognizable graphical style. And the performance battle here was simple. Too many small polygons? The CPU will slow down. Too many big polygons? The GPU will slow down. It was a balancing act. And fun fact time, the PS1's CPU can handle a mixture of triangles and quadrilaterals to save on how much data you need to process and feed to the GPU. Since subdivision is necessary due to the aforementioned texture warping problems, using quadrilaterals for the subdivision results in us saving a lot of processing time. And also keep in mind that the drawbacks present that I mentioned earlier basically all existed so Sony could get the console out on the market at the price point that it was priced at. Compare that to the Nintendo 64, where the main bottleneck is just the memory and everything surrounding it. Sure, to developers, maybe the biggest singular fault of the Nintendo 64 was the lack of a CD drive. It's why Square left Nintendo for Sony, alongside like a hundred other companies. And yet, when you accept that Nintendo was boneheaded with that specific decision and there was no changing it, you can then look at the other decisions they made that ended up causing problems, and that is where the memory comes in. With terrible latency, bad bandwidth, partially influenced by that latency, and a unified architecture, which means that the RAM was shared with every component. In essence, this means that trading games for the N64 was like trading games for basically no other console. On the PS1, you're writing games to be fast. On the N64, you have to write them to be small. A lot of the fancy frame buffer effects aren't that expensive on PlayStation, yet on the Nintendo 64, they can really bog the game down. Of course, on both systems, you'd ideally still want your console's code to neatly fit into the instruction cache, however, the penalties for this on the PS1 were also far lower. If you can truly master the Nintendo 64, like how some homebrew developers did, like Aze, you can do some really cool things. And yet you can probably imagine, if the Nintendo 64 had a 32-bit CPU, maybe more comparable to that of the PS1, like at a third of the speed, it could have probably meant they could have saved more cash that they could have used on other features. Maybe they could have had a separate video memory, or better memory in general, so that extracting the performance out of the N64 wasn't such a Herculean task it took people like 30 plus years to figure out. So, if there were essentially literally zero reasons for Nintendo to include the 64-bit features, and the only effects this had on the console were negative, why did they add them? Well, marketing. That's literally it. They just added them because of marketing. It was because, oh, higher bit equals better. It's a 64-bit console. That's why the games were called, like, Mario 64, to emphasize how much better they were than if they were 32 bits. That's why Mega Man Legends 64 is so much shitter than Mega Man Legends. But the funny part is, that they could have just used the RSP for the bit war, 
they could have called it the 128-bit system instead. You see, the RCP was the Nintendo 64's graphics system. It had the RSP, which was essentially a second CPU, and the RDP, which was the actual GPU part that drew things to the screen. Now, the second CPU lacked the 64-bit mode that the main CPU had, then it was maybe a little bit lobotomized, however instead, it had a vector unit with 32 128-bit registers, which could handle 8 16-bit vectors at once. Yes, simmed on a console from 1996. Quite cool. And even with that kind of power, they still wasted money on a hilariously overspec CPU when they could have just said that the 128-bit sim made it the Nintendo 128. And you know, I wouldn't even disagree. And the funniest part, I think they could have cut costs way further. Why even have two processes? I know that sounds insane, asinine, I don't know, but why not just have the RSP be the CPU? I'm sure you'd have to change some things around with how the bus works, some priority features, whatever, whatever, but if you change some of that stuff around and add some of the features that were previously lobotomized back, this honestly seems like a way better idea than just having a second unnecessary CPU. The funny thing is, the RSP was about two-thirds as fast as the CPU, and the CPU was about three times as fast as the Trilly needed to be. So realistically, the RSP running at the clock speed of the CPU would probably just be running at the same speed as the CPU, and the console wouldn't really have any negative cost to it. And any cost that would be incurred by having to graft on the parts of the CPU that were previously taken off of it onto the RSP would be counteracted by the fact that we don't have a main CPU anymore, and that would have taken off a huge amount of complexity. It would have saved a ton of money. And the big reason why the system wasn't clocked as high as it could have maybe gone was because Nintendo was worried about the cooling. And if there was no CPU to heat the system up, they could have probably clocked the RSP higher. I was thinking about all of this because it would have been more similar to, of all things, the Dreamcast if they did it this way. It also wouldn't fix all of the Nintendo 64's problems, but like, I don't know, man, it would have been an interesting idea if nothing else. But no, we didn't get that. No Nintendo 128 that was actually a 32-bit CPU in disguise. Instead, we got a console that gave us all-time classics, like Buck Bumble. And also, I guess, Mario and Zelda. The final thing I should mention is that little question of how they could run 64-bit games on a 32-bit system. Um, most of the games were just running basically entirely in 32-bit instructions, and if they were using 64-bit instructions by chance, you can just rewrite the instructions to basically, you know, you can handle more than 32-bit values on a, you know, CPU, you, you just have to handle them a little bit weirdly. You can just have huge, huge, huge numbers that are like 128-bit or higher. It, it, it's just handling them is a little bit weird when you have to interpret them. But what I'm saying is the 64-bit thing was stupid, goodbye.